Well, here we are in the Marriott Center. I'm trying to stand a little bit close to you so that we have this intimate feeling in a 20,000 seat hall. Now, Lisa and I are so grateful to be with you this morning, and we bring the greetings of the First Presidency to you. They never fail to extend their love to the Latter-day Saints where and whenever we assemble under their direction. <clears throat> and this morning, we're going to talk about two institutions with a deep history that converged together for this devotional and this week. BYU and Education Week. And so I thought there might be some interest and maybe even a little bit of entertainment value to travel back in time and to peel back some of the layers of history surrounding both Education Week and BYU. It's been a great tradition here, as President Worthen mentioned, for 97 years now. It began in January 1922, just over 46 years following the founding of what is now Brigham Young University, and it was called Leadership Week at the time. Now, during the first 30 years, it was held in, in the wintertime in order to better accommodate farmers in rural areas, and lecture topics included farming, homemaking, and one leadership training in 1922 was titled, The Boy, How to Teach Him. <clears throat> we remember my mother was a faithful attendee every year, and I've not forgotten those three or four days when she left every summer and was away in Provo, and immediately upon her return, being the recipient of wonderful gospel principles that were shared her, with her at Education Week, as well as others that always seems like it included job charts <laughs> and trying to make us better children. I even remember when she came back with the idea of extending our food resources with soy additives to our meals. So what I'd like to do is just talk about each decade for a few minutes, which began with BYU Education Week in the 1920s. Things on campus were very different when Leadership Week began in 1922, with the entire BYU student body of 25 seniors, 30 juniors, 57 sophomores, and 184 freshmen. So that's a total of 296 students. And for that first leadership week held in January 1922, there were around 3,000 people who attended. It was a different time and place when football players could fold their helmets and put them in their pocket after the game. <clears throat> And the women's swim team looked lovely here. You can also see here President Heber J. Grant seated at the microphone in College Hall to a capacity audience in 1926. Now here we get a glimpse of social life on campus in the 1930s. What a fun looking dance we see here. And we see the co-eds co dressed in ski gear for the annual winter carnival. President David O. McKay had several opportunities to participate in Education Week. One is shown here in College Hall in the, 19th or, in the 1930s. Now, we know how World War II disrupted the world, and it disrupted Education Week as well. It was canceled for several years in the 1940s. Here you see an image of the track and field 100-yard dash event, and this is an image of homecoming royalty uh, in the, in the uh, 30s. Here we see that Education Week classes included instruction in agronomy, 
drawing many farmers in for coursework such as soil analysis. I'm not sure to what to make of the hats worn by these 1950s BYU students. <laughs> it looks like it was some sort of friendly freshman initiation, as you see the sign, no fresh allowed. My mom and dad met here in the late 40s and early 50s. Here is my mother on the left with her roommate, can you see the Y on the mountain behind them? And mom and dad met at a matinee dance here on campus, and they were married in 1951. The crowds were growing year after year for Education Week classes with speakers such as Elder LeGrand Richards. So now we're moving to the turbulent 60s you can see that there were mirrors in the hallways urging students to see yourself as others see you. And this is a student, uh, an assembly introducing the new student body officers. I suspect that there are probably some in the hall here who know Brother Russ Booth and Sister Susan Stoom, who we see uh, standing in the circle here. Education week registration at a single table with an orderly line. <laughs> now that was just in the 60s. There are quite a few of us in the room here who remember the 60s quite well. Okay, it appears that the campus unrest of the 1960s spilled over onto the BYU campus in the, high, in the 1970s. highlighted by this very important social issue of french fries. <laughs> and now you can see this really classy photo of President Kimball and Sister Kimball at the Centennial Founders Day Parade in October 1975. We couldn't do this without an image of the Osmonds <laughs> in their costume singing One Bad Apple. <laughs> and here's a cute young couple enjoying some of the ice cream at the BYU Creamery. And it was in the 1970s that Education Week registration finally entered the computer era. <laughs> okay, let's, let's skip now forward to present day, what we see today with Education Week. It was a year ago that Sister Joy Jones, the general primary president, was the Tuesday devotional speaker. And her address and other BYU classes, Education Week classes, were broadcast to many millions around the globe via various channels, including BYU TV, which now reaches 52 million households via Dish Network, Direct TV, and cable carriers across the United States. In a typical week, there are over two million views on these channels. So it's astonishing, isn't it, when we think of the difference in just under 100 years when all of this began with 3,000 registered attendees who were participating in and viewing then Leadership Week in person. So part of the exercise that we just experienced just now was to highlight the ongoing restoration of the gospel. It's, it's, it's really inspiring to behold the unfolding expansion in just one element of the restoration, BYU Education Week, over these few short decades. Uh, October last year, Lisa and I accompanied President and Sister Nelson to South America for his South American ministry tour. And during our final few days there, which ended in, the, in Concepcion, Chile, at the Chile Temple dedication, I was blessed to be able to sit next to President Nelson during the final 
press conference and interview when he said the following. This is a global ministry. We're prophets for the whole world. All of God's children, not just the members of the church. So on this tour, we've talked to people in five different countries. If there are 200 countries in the world and more, five is such a small drop in the bucket. Yeah, we'll get around, but we'll still miss more than we'll touch, but we'll try. We won't give up just because it's a big job. We're just at the exponential phase of growth, yes, but it will continue. The Lord said, I will hasten my work in its time, and he makes good on his promises. We're witnesses to a, a process of restoration if you think the church has been fully restored, uh, you're just seeing the beginning. There's much more to come. Wait till next year. <laughs> and then the next year. <laughs> Eat your vitamin pills. Get your rest. <laughs> it's going to be exciting. Well, it is exciting, isn't it? And the work is being hastened and we see the work hastened by our dear loving prophet, President Nelson, whose birthday we celebrate soon, his 95th birthday. We think of President Ballard, soon to be 93 years old, I think this month, and so uh, we try to keep up with those two, along with the First Presidency and other members of the Twelve. It was a thrill for me to be able to hear him speak and testify of this, knowing all that has taken place since the restoration of the Lord's true and living church in the early 1800s. We're blessed to have this prophet in our day who continues the Lord's work that began almost 200 years ago in upstate New York. We'll celebrate the 200th anniversary of that event in the sacred grove where God the Father and Jesus Christ appeared to Joseph Smith. And so for me right now, I, I refer to a valuable and an instructive statement that is found in Preach My Gospel, counsel given to missionaries, which seems so relevant for me right now. I quote, whatever your initial approach refer quickly and simply to the restoration of the gospel, for this is our unique message to the world. It is unique, and it is our message for the world, and so I'd like to share with you some of my thoughts and testimony of the restoration of the gospel. And so to do this, I want to invite you once again to travel back a bit further in time to the early 1800s, almost exactly 190 years ago, to a small group of what we would well call millennials today. Okay, this would be Joseph Smith, Emma Smith, Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, and E.B. Grandin. And the boomers of that time would have been Martin Harris and Peter Whitmer. Just look at their ages. It's rather striking. 23, 24, 22, 24, 23, our recently returned missionary ages. And then Brother Harris and Brother Whitmer at 45 years old and 55 years old. Now, I find it rather remarkable that the Lord chose this young of an age group to introduce the dispensation of the fullness of times. So really, to help you adjust your travel back to 1829, let me create a little bit of context for you. Just nine years before 1829 then was April 1820. And it was in April of 1820 that Joseph Smith experienced the first vision at age 14, with the appearance of God the Father and His Son, 
Jesus Christ. Just six years before this 1829 date, in September of 1823, Moroni, a Book of Mormon prophet, appeared to Joseph Smith for the first time and among other things described a record that Joseph would later translate and over which he would become an important steward. Joseph was then directed to Hill Cumorah, and every September from 1823 to 1827, he was tutored there and prepared by Moroni for the day that he would take into his possession this ancient record engraved upon plates with the appearance of gold, as he described them. And indeed, after Joseph Smith had taken possession of the plates in 1828, he began translation with Martin Harris as his primary scribe. Their work continued long enough to create a manuscript that was 116 pages in length. Now through a series of events, Martin Harris persuaded Joseph against instructions that were previously given by the Lord to allow him temporary possession of the 116-page manuscript, and it was subsequently lost. Of course, this caused much anguish for Joseph Smith and his family. And as a result, Joseph lost his gift of translation and the possession of the plates for a time, which brings us back to 1829 with this small group and others who were instruments in the hands of the Lord. It was April 7th, 1829, that Oliver Cowdery, accompanied by Joseph's brother Samuel Smith, knocked on the door of, the jo of Joseph and Emma's home in Harmony, Pennsylvania, with an inspired offer by Oliver to assist in the translation of the ancient record by acting as his scribe. Here is a depiction of that event. Joseph. <laughs> Samuel. <laughs> I'm so happy you're here. And who's your friend? Joseph, this is Mr. Oliver Cowdery. The man is half white-tailed deer. Practically ran the whole way here just to see you. Joseph Smith. Mr. Smith, I've come to inquire about the work which you are endeavoring to accomplish. Mm. Oliver, I've been expecting you. Please call me Joseph. We talked late into the night. Joseph recounted the tribulations and miracles he had experienced and how he obtained the record from an angel of God. Where are the plates now? They're safe. May I see them? For now, you cannot. I've made a covenant with the Lord to show them to no one. But if I cannot see them, how will we work? By the gift and power of God. You will soon learn that with the Lord, all things are possible. Shall we commit? Thee for sending such a fine fellow to assist in this thy work. We pray for thy spirit to attend us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. I shall speak a dozen or so words at a time and pause so you have a moment to write. And he shall be called Jesus Christ the Son of God, the Father of heaven and earth, the creator of all things from the beginning, and his mother shall be called Mary. The creator of all things. And his mother shall be called Mary. Oh, no, 
Edison, right? It needs to be exact. The creator of all things from the beginning. From the beginning. And his mother shall be called Mary. Well, what we just viewed is the first step of our walk through 85 stunning and miraculous days following the day that Oliver met Joseph and Emma for the first time. It is clear that the heavens were opened and a waterfall of revelation and manifestation commenced in a special and unusual way. Together, Joseph and Oliver, through the months of April, May, and June, recommenced the work of translation. By June 30th, they completed the translation and recording of the Book of Mormon on 491 pages comprised of 269,510 words. Some years later, Oliver would reflect that these were days never to be forgotten. In discussing the translation, President Nelson said in 2016, quote, how the translation was accomplished is not fully known because the prophet de deliberately said little about that sacred task. Yet we do have a few precious insights. God prepared sacred objects to assist Joseph with the translation. Interpreters were buried with the golden plates. Joseph used the interpreters and other seer stones that the Lord provided in the translation process. Such instruments were used by prophets throughout scriptural history to translate texts and receive divine communications, close quote. So what we do know is what was done is an absolute miracle. Even in today's standard with modern tools of electronic dictionaries, word processing, machine learning and translation, the pace and subsequent work product are almost unthinkable. President Nelson refers to this fondly as a miraculous miracle. Yet there was more. The 85 days of spring 1829 brought much more than translation and recording duties. Remarkably, monumental elements of the restoration took place in this time as well. These two required the time and attention of Joseph and Oliver, drawing them away from their translation efforts. Each of these activities have been carefully analyzed, and scholars believe that in reality, the actual time available for translation was just 60 to 65 estimated working days. So when one considers what other events occurred in April, May, and June, the translation is even more impressive. Here I've summarized some, but not all of the documented events, which would have taken away from Book of Mormon translation time. Let's take a look. John the Baptist restored the Aaronic priesthood. Peter, James, and John restored the Melchizedek priesthood. Thirteen sections of the Doctrine and Covenants were received and recorded. Each of these events are a story and a miracle in and of itself. Here in film, we view a depiction of the miracle associated with just one of these miracles, the Lord's hand in setting up the relocation of Joseph and Emma to Fayette, New York, where David Whitmer lived with his parents, the Peter Whitmer family. This is a demonstration of how temporal, even seemingly mundane events occurred through miracles. David, a letter came for you today. What does it say? It's from Oliver Caltry and Joseph Smith. They want to bring their work here. Why here? Why our home? We are continually threatened. The Lord has directed us to ask if you would bring us into your home where we might complete the translating the plates without interruption. The days are so full, Peter. David, with so many mouths to feed, we cannot afford to lose any time. But Father, Oliver is convinced that this is the work of God. Then the good Lord will see that it is completed. Now is the time for plowing not for bringing guests into our home.
father later told me if I finished plowing, he would reconsider allowing Joseph and Oliver to come to our home. I threw myself into the work, but it progressed very slowly. Lord, if this is truly thy work, prepare a way for us to be a part of it. We should finish plowing by Thursday. I want to sow the field by the end of the... prayed that the Lord's will might be made now. Take the wagon. Bring them here. Tell them our home is theirs. <clears throat> this is one of the beautiful, less known miracles of the Restoration. And there were more. Uh, here are additional events taking place in this 85-day window. The application for a copyright for the Book of Mormon was made and received. Joseph began and ended the tedious process of finding a printer for the Book of Mormon. He also secured the financing of the Book of Mormon, which was arranged through the gracious pledge of Martin Harris's farm for collateral. Finally, the long-awaited day for the three witnesses to view the plates with the angel, followed by the viewing, of, the viewing of the plates by the eight witnesses. Now, one of the eight witnesses, Hiram Page, a son-in-law of Peter Whitmer, later in life reaffirmed his testimony of the Book of Mormon and Joseph Smith as its divine translator. He said, to say that a man of Joseph's ability, what at the time did not know how to pronounce the word Nephi, could write a book of 600 pages as correct as the Book of Mormon without supernatural power, well, it would be treating the God of heaven with contempt to deny these testimonies. I add my own personal witness to Hiram's as well. My dear brothers and sisters, just consider what we have learned 85 miraculous days. Imagine accomplishing the complete translation of the Book of Mormon and all the additional events that we've just described in about two weeks less time than a typical semester at BYU. That is what Joseph Smith did. Over many years, I have studied intently the events surrounding the coming forth of the Book of Mormon. If we had time, we could spend another hour on the miraculous preparation just for the printing of the book to take place. And so my conclusion as a result of my deep dive into the events surrounding the coming forth of the Book of Mormon is that is that it is truly a heavenly directed miracle, the origins of which are irrefutable. But there is more, isn't there? President Nelson said, 
the value of the Book of Mormon lies not in the miracle of its re translation, miraculous as it was. The great worth of the Book of Mormon is that it is another testament of Jesus Christ. Its four major authors, Nephi, Jacob, Mormon, and Moroni, were all eyewitnesses of the Lord, as was Joseph, the inspired translator of that book. Well, we've discussed the miracles associated with the translation and publication of the Book of Mormon, but miracles don't cease there. Each and every day, miracles surrounding the Book of Mormon continue. Imagine within our grasp another testament of Jesus Christ. Joseph Smith described its significance in its introduction page. It states, I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and the keystone of our religion and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. The power of the Book of Mormon comes in the mighty change that comes into the lives of those who read it with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ. I believe that is why the prophet Joseph Smith defined it as the keystone of our religion. The Book of Mormon is the engine that powers conversion and a change of heart leading us closer to Jesus Christ. Let me share a story that might demonstrate this. Four missionaries, a senior couple and two elders serving in Micronesia, walked into the tiny island's only attorney's office where they were serving. They had a problem. They needed an amendment to a birth certificate for a membership record of a girl in their branch. Previously, the municipal office had no sympathy for their request. They said it would be too hard, and it didn't matter anyway. We all know her, and we know when she was born. So the city turned down the missionary's request. It was suggested that they go to the only attorney's office on the island where they met a highly educated and deeply respected man. The missionary sat across his desk, described their plight, to which he replied, that within 30 days, he would be able to get an amended birth certificate. Then at this point, he stood up and walked around his desk. He closed the door and walked around behind his desk and opened his desk drawer. And much to their surprise, he placed a worn out Book of Mormon on his desk. And to even greater surprise, he then stated, I've been reading your book for over 20 years, and I know it's true. It was given to me by a fellow student when I was studying in the USA. He handed the book to the missionaries, and they each marveled as they looked at his marked-up copy of the Book of Mormon. And then he said, I can't join your church because I smoke two or three packs of cigarettes a day. My family would be devastated, and I would likely lose my job to which the missionaries replied, we can help. <laughs> and they did. The teaching was easy because he already had a testimony of the Book of Mormon. And with some time and help, he overcame his smoking habit, which was much harder. And although his family was upset, especially his wife, he was baptized just months later on Christmas Day. Well, he began to share stories from the Book of Mormon and hymns of the Restoration with his wife. She too gained a testimony, and two months later, she was baptized. Here, Lisa and I with them on their tiny island in Micronesia. Since then, most of their children have also been baptized, and he has served as a leader in the branch. The Book of Mormon is a miracle, and it brings forth miracles which, which can lead to happiness and lasting joy. I'm not aware of another book anywhere else of which Jesus Christ himself testifies of its truth. In describing the work Joseph, Joseph was called to do, the Lord declared, he has translated the book, even that part which I have commanded him, and as your Lord and your God liveth, it is true. Well, it's time to close the devotional, and I want to conclude by asking you, what are you going to do? How do you make the Book of Mormon 
your keystone to your testimony of Jesus Christ. We start by becoming personally familiar with it, by reading, pondering, and praying about its truthfulness. We could think about the devotion of the prophet Joseph Smith to get the book to us, perhaps resolve to spend more time reading it. It's simple for us. We have it with us almost continually. Take some of the precious screen time and some of the other pursuits and make it Book of Mormon screen time. It's really quite simple, isn't it? And it came to pass that I, Nephi, returned from speaking with the Lord to the tent of my father. And it came to pass that he spake unto me, saying, Behold, I have dreamed a dream in the which the Lord hath commanded me that thou and thy brethren shall return to Jerusalem. How about at least 10 minutes a day. How do you feel about that? All in favor? <laughs> Any opposed? <laughs> well, I'd like, <clears throat> I'd like to share my testimony with you by sharing the testimony of my fifth great-grandfather, Edward Stevenson, who as a 13-year-old boy in 1833 listened to and recorded the testimony of Joseph Smith who came to his community in Pontiac, Michigan and spoke in the old log schoolhouse. It changed his life. Here's what he said. I can still very well remember many of the words of the boy prophet as they were uttered in simplicity, but with a power which was irresistible to all present. Here are some of the prophet's words. With uplifted hand, he said, I am a witness that there is a God, for I saw him in open day while praying in a silent grove in the spring of 1820. He further testified that God the Father, pointing to a separate personage in the likeness of himself, said, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. He continues, Oh, how these words thrilled my entire system and filled me with joy unspeakable to behold one who, like Paul the Apostle of olden time, could with boldness testify that he had been in the presence of Jesus Christ. And so, brothers and sisters, <clears throat> I conclude with my testimony of each of these heavenly events that we have considered today. They are all elements of the ongoing restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the restored church of Jesus Christ, the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And it fills me with unspeakable joy to know that Jesus Christ stands at the head of this church, that the Book of Mormon was translated by the power and gift of God and it is the Word of God, and that Joseph Smith was the prophet of this final dispensation and that President Nelson is the Lord's living prophet and his mouthpiece on the earth today. And finally, brothers and sisters, I bear my witness of Jesus Christ to which the Book of Mormon leads us. I bear a witness of his sacred role as our Savior and, of our, and as our Redeemer. And I offer that testimony and witness to you in the name of Jesus Christ, amen.